With a grateful heart, give thanks to the Holy One, give thanks. Because He's given Jesus Christ, His Son, give thanks with a grateful heart, give thanks. To the Holy One give thanks Because He's given Jesus Christ His Son And now let the weak say I am strong Let the poor say I am rich Because of what? The Lord has done for us. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what the Lord has done for us. Give thanks. Тебе наш Господь, хвала, Тебе Бог Святой, хвала, За Иисуса, Сына Твоего, хвала, Тебе наш Господь, хвала, Тебе Бог Святой, хвала. За Иисуса, Сына Твоего. Теперь слабый скажет, я силен, Бедный скажет, я богат, Благодаря тому, что Бог нам дал. Теперь Слабый скажет, я силен, Бедный скажет, я богат, Благодаря тому, что Бог нам дал. Give thanks. Let's sing it together in English. <laughs> Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks. Because he's given Jesus Christ his son. And now let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich. Because of what the Lord has done for us. And now let the weak I am strong let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us give thanks yay <laughs> This is uh, Valeri Vodka. Volko, yeah. Volko. Uh, Valeri, you could call him Val, or Noah calls him Jack. <laughs> and, but he's our son, and as you'll see, uh, for real.
Um, now he was, as a baby, newborn, he was put in a shoe box and left at the front door of an orphanage in Ukraine. And um, it was called the House of, of Babies, this orphanage, uh, ages zero to four. So his first four years, uh, he was in the uh, House of Babes. And what was that like? In Jokosi? House of Babes, yeah. yeah. In Jokosi. Yeah, do you remember that well? Uh, kind of. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I remember my, uh, like, um, gray, uh, dark document. Document. Not dark, dark. Oh, it's just okay. Patty help. <laughs> no, no. I, yes, I remember, but not um, clear. Okay, you you did tell me that you didn't have a name. D yes. Yeah, we have uh, like numbers. Every person uh, often have number. Okay, and the was there electricity there? Yes, and when uh, Ukraine separate from USSR when. And, when broken, USSR, uh, that's Ukrainian de independent, and uh, uh, Russia supply to electricity and gas, and when broken, that's Russia stop. Yeah. And that's so you, uh, your power was cut off. Yeah, that's that's true. So the house of babes with all these other babies had no power. Yeah, and Ukraine start. Or Ukraine had no power. Yeah. That's and so, uh, were there, um, in the House of Babes, were, it was, uh, did you have plenty to eat? No, not no. really, no. And did you have running water? Running? Running water. <laughs> did you turn on I'm and not, Yes, I see it, sorry. Yeah. sorry. <laughs> you know, you chased it. Yeah. <laughs> I cannot, yeah, that's. Uh, no, no, that's... No running water? No, no, no. So how often did you get bathed? We have like um, um, some establishment when um, um, like a bath, um, no, it's called... Um, bath? Bucket. Bucket. Bucket water in uh, like... Yeah, yeah. Um, Just wash off. Yeah. The okay, now the, the, the people that were there taking care of you, mm -hmm. Um, were you well treated or mistreated or were they, were they kind to yeah, you? Yes, so, some kind, some, some kind. kind and every person uh, often would try to uh, call like uh, teachers and uh, who lo look after us like mom and Yeah, dad. they tried but they didn't have much yeah, to work with yeah, and yeah. just tried to keep you alive yeah, I guess. Yeah. So it was crowded, there were a lot of babies in there? Uh, yes, this is crowded, I think it's um, 200 or 200. nearly 300. Yeah. Often, yeah. Did you have beds or did you sleep on the floor? Yeah, we sleep in the floor. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that's I so you, remember. So you were a number, not a name. Yeah. Yeah. We and have like a bracelet. Bracelet with your number on yeah. it? Yeah. Um, now, some of you are very familiar with Vic Jacobson. Uh, Vic is uh, an evangelist from uh, England and um, who came through Williams in the uh, early 80s. And uh, Vic was an orphan also. His, his granddad, he's from Southampton, his granddad went down with the Titanic and, and Vic never knew his dad and he never knew his mother until later in his life. His mother was a, a prostitute and he led her to the Lord on her deathbed, which is an amazing story. But uh, Vic grew up in an orphanage and when he got out of the orphanage, he became a criminal. He joined the gangs, and, and he was locked up uh, for theft in the Winchester prison. And there was a, um, uh, he was in solitary confinement, and there was a Gideon Bible in there. And Vic had dyslexia, so he had always been told he was slow because he couldn't read. And he's sitting there alone, counted all the brick, and, it, and, and the Gideon Bible, King James 1611, he, he, thought, he, he thought Christianity was for good people, and he knew he wasn't one. And so, but he had nothing else to do in that prison cell, so he picks up and he starts reading the King James Bible, and, and he finally gets to this Jesus. He said, well, this Jesus is my kind of guy. You know, they didn't like him either. And then he gets to the thief on the cross, the thief on the cross, and he was a thief. 
And he said, I wonder if he knew his mom and dad. And Jesus said, this day you'll be with me in paradise. So Vic gets down on his knees. He's like 18 years old. And here's his sinner's prayer. He said, God, I'll give you 10 days to change my life. If you hadn't done it by then, you've copped it. That's British for you, blew it. God, I'll give you 10 days to change my life. Now fast forward, it's amazing how God has used the spirit of this one orphan prisoner to transform and bring hope to so many lives, orphans and prisoners, and, you know, as you'll see. So this whole story is, is a connection uh, with Vic Jacobson coming through here and who's, who's a part of our family. Now, that's Vic, uh, surrounded by orphans, and the house of babes in, in uh, Cherkasy, Ukraine, where these children come and they're a number, Vic goes in and sees, you know, the depravity of the place, and it breaks his heart, so he gets busy. Now, when he came through in 84, I had just recorded an album called Bug Zapper, and, and Vic got a, that cassette, Bug Zapper, and he goes back, and, and he invites me over. To, with, we've been doing prison streets, jails, a yard from the gates of hell ever since then. That was the first trip to England. There's been this really had opened a door all over the world. Um, and we, we have really been close, close friends and companions and, and uh, uh, fellow servants uh, together. He's a mentor to me. I've learned so much from our friend, and I, I treasure his friendship. And uh, right now, his ministry is taking care of his wife, Sue, uh, who has Alzheimer's. And, uh, and he's stopped uh, everything else to, you know, to give her care. And I talked with him on Skype this morning, and they're praying for us right now. But... You know, William's family is, is Vic's family. And um, so he goes in and he sees the house of babes and the condition that it's in. And he comes back and what he would do is he would do these fundraising tours in England to, to uh, raise the awareness of the plight of orphans in Ukraine or South Africa, wherever the case may be. And, uh, and I was a part of those uh, music tours and that's how I've got a million stories about that. I won't take you all night, I won't chase rabbits. I, I'll try to stay on, on course. But Vic goes, sees House of Babes, comes back, does a fundraiser uh, of concert tours and, and uh, letting the need be known. And this is what the House of Babes looks like today. And these, can y'all see the screen okay? Everybody, okay. Do we need to lower these lights some or, or is that good? It's okay, all right. This is, uh, Patty and I were over there uh, several years ago and um, and you can see the children are well kept. The place is, you know, as central heat and air, uh, hot and cold running water, uh, salaries for staff to help take care of these kids. And, uh, and there's a couple. <laughs> now, this guy, at what age did you leave House of Babes? Five, no, no, yeah, nearly five years. Five years. Uh, yeah. So five years, they, you still don't have a name. Yeah. And they transfer you to the to orphanage, orphanage yeah. okay, and, and they give you a name there. Yeah, and orphanage gave me a name. Okay, and uh, this is what he moved into. Uh, now, what was a day, a typical day in the orphanage for you? Would you say? Um, you get up in the morning and yes, uh, wake, wake up and go to uh, like exciting exercise, ex exercise and. Uh, after exercise, we have a breakfast, and after breakfast, what would you have for breakfast? Uh, daily breakfast. This is uh, like potatoes, whole potatoes, mm -hmm. and water. And water. And sometimes piece of bread. Okay, that yes. was breakfast. Yeah, that's breakfast. Okay. And uh, after breakfast, after breakfast, we go to school, and school very close. The school was there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And after. School, uh, after school, we go to dinner. Dinner? Yeah, like uh, or supper. And what would you have for dinner? D in dinner, we have a uh, soup, yeah, and uh, two pieces of bread and glass of water. Okay. Yeah. That was every day? Yeah, that's his daily, daily feeding. Were you always hungry? Yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't know anything else? No. And so how many, uh, in, in these conditions, 
a part of that time, you did not have electricity there. Yeah. And uh, for, I think for four years. And then you, um, Vic comes through. Yeah. <laughs> and you were sleeping on the floor. Yeah with 300 other orphans in this dilapidated place with outhouses that, you know, the stench, it would it'd break your heart to go in there and see the conditions. And, and each of the children were in swaddling clothes and all they had was on their back. And, uh, and he was one of, the, of them, obviously. And then when Vic came in, they got some, uh, yeah. some bunk beds and things. Now, the, this church, the church at Williams, has been supporting Vic ever since those, uh, those days, you know, up to this day. So it's not just praying for for him, and he started a work called Hope Now, and uh, and it was through the charity of Hope Now that he was accomplishing, you know, all these things. Okay, so then uh, that's where I first met uh, Val. He must have been uh, nine or ten. I don't remember, but uh, but when I saw him, he was with all the other kids, and uh, but it was like like looking at a, a a group of people like this, and one is just like a snapshot. It's just like a Kodak on your mind. And, I, and, and it, was, it caught me. Okay, so I leave there, never knew his name or, or anything about him, but I remember this, this, there was something different about this young man. And I, okay, so now what happens uh, in the orphanage is when you turn 16 years old, you get kicked out. You know, literally. They, they, they do not have the funds to, to accommodate, you know, all the needs and and when someone turns 16, they have to go out on the street. They just put them out. And so what typically happens when you, when you don't have any family and you have no support and you have no job skills, you know, no opportunities, a number of those young people become the supply for human trafficking. And uh, they sell their bodies to pimps. And, uh, and, and that's a horrible, horrible crisis that's happening right now. And by the way, I-20 is one of the main thoroughfares for human trafficking in the world, and, uh, which, is a, which is another you know, incredible uh, need. Now, uh, so these orphans, uh, some will start peddling drugs and join the mafia and go into crime, but a high percentage of them commit suicide. So this is what he was facing. Now, when um, most of the children there had cousins and aunts and uncles and who would come on like a Saturday a month, they would have visitation day, and he had nobody to come see him. So he would go up in the woods while the others were visiting by himself and just wait. And then uh, and some of his friends were adopted into families, but nobody wanted him. Okay? And I... I asked him, how did that feel? Did, did it had to hurt your feelings terribly. And did you think something was wrong with you that nobody wanted you? Um, yes, yeah, sometimes feel bad, but I understand I'm not alone. Yes, because I'm, uh, when I'm 10 years, uh, I uh, realize Jesus work in my life and he is a uh, protect and he is uh, like uh, my hope and my love and so so I'm, you yes. though you were in that situation do you ever remember a time that you were alone you've never been alone no no, no. but you were 10 he is my family <laughs> jesus is your yeah. family yeah. so but when you were 10 some people from a church came in, yeah. and you and you realize what his name is. Yeah. He is my father, mother, sister, brother. <laughs> okay, so yeah. so there is this this other friend who was a classmate of Vic's in college at Spurgeon College, named Arthur. Now Arthur is the main uh, part of the story. Arthur would go in the, with the team into the orphanages and share the gospel with using magic tricks and balloons and so forth. So Arthur comes in and, uh, and gets Val to assist him in one of the tricks. Okay, so Val, Val is now uh, 14. Arthur comes back a year later and, and Val knows he's got a year. And he says, please adopt me. <laughs> Arthur, adopt me. Let me go home with you. I've got to leave next year. Well, Ar Arthur is, you know, has a mother with cancer he's taking care of. He does not have the financial resources. He, he lives in England. 
but he's, he said it broke his heart, but there was no way he could take him in. He said, but I'll do this. I'll correspond with you, and we'll be praying for you every day. So that began a correspondence for a, a year's period of time. And, uh, uh, and that's Arthur. Okay, so God sent this father figure, and, and there's this group of, of people in Dover, England, have joined the prayer support, you know, for Val, and he also sets up a savings account that anybody, any of the neighbors, you know, want to give some, you know, to help support this young man, you know, Arthur set that up. Now, the correspondence, he knows no English, so the, so the correspondence, there's translators in Vic's office of Hope Now to, uh, to see that the, the communication flows between those two. All right, so now he still doesn't have anywhere to go until uh, enter Korsun, Ukraine. Now, this is on the way to Korsun. Korsun is a village that was uh, about an hour and a half drive from the Sfola orphanage where he was. And this is how the, the people live there. Uh, they we're on the way to Korsun now, the village. That's an outhouse. Okay. Now, in Korsun, in 1987, it must have been, Vic comes through, and he says there is a church meeting in homes and that's growing, and they desperately need a church building, and they have the property. He said, I think it would be wonderful. Now, Barry Howard's going to, going to be leaving. What a wonderful time for First Baptist Church of Williams to have a fundraiser to build a church for the people in Corson. How many of you were here then? Look at that. What was it, 14,000? It's amazing what a dollar will buy over there. So for like, he said 14000 they can build their church building. Okay, now in, in this humble, rural, outhouse, backward village, I want to show you the First Baptist Church of Williams, Corson Campus. Wow. <laughs> Now, would you believe this guy, that white-haired guy right there, would you believe that he speaks fluent Ukraine and English? He's carrying on a conversation with him. That's me, and I don't. You can, you, you can put would you believe in any question. You can tell him the lie you want to, right? Okay. Now, would you believe, look at this. These people are so grateful to God for the support that allowed them to build this. Look how they keep the flowers and, and you know, and all. Now, right around the corner there is, is the outhouse for this church. And the outhouse, uh, it's a nice outhouse. It's got concrete with a drain in it and everything. Now, it's really cold in the winter. But uh, now, this right over in the right there, you see the corner of the roof, that, that, that little house that needs a roof, that's where he moved into when he left the orphanage. Okay, now... Uh, Vic sends him a bus ticket. So when he walks out from the orphanage, he gets on a bus and he's going to Corson to meet some people he's never had any contact with and never known before. But he's not alone. <laughs> okay. All right, so he goes. So this church family in Corson, uh, there we are. Uh, as you can see, uh, there's a Val and, and Patty and me. As you can they, somebody got our seat on the second row right there. <laughs> so they let us move up front. And all, but this this is your uh, church family in, in in a course in Ukraine, and this is the um, now that's a Misha and and Vera Spodka, mm -hmm. and Olga Olga and, and Nastya Nastya yeah that's his daughters uh, that's, that's their daughters and Nastya just had a baby right yeah yeah okay and uh, now uh, Misha. Um, Vera leads him to the Lord. Vera's dad died in a Russian Siberia camp for his, put there for his faith in Christ. And she's had a relationship with Jesus all these years, and she led him to the Lord. And he felt this call to preach, but he's about five feet tall, and he said, God wouldn't call anybody as short as I am <laughs> to preach. You know? Well, she, she kept ministering to him, and, you know, and so, so he became pastor of the church now. All right, now, I was in uh, Cherkasy at, um, at the Alpha House, we call it, which was the, the home base for, for Hope Now, where we go to the, uh, these uh, orphanages and prisons and so forth from there. That was our headquarters. 
And I look out the window, and here comes this guy in a coat and tie, all dressed up. And, and Vic says, that's Misha from Corson. You need to go to Corson and see the Church Williams built. You know, said, yeah, I knew, I knew this was a divine appointment. And this began a really close relationship. This is about 15 years ago. Okay, so what had, what had happened is he and his family were sleeping in that church. And, and they move out of the way, out of the Sunday school rooms for Sunday, you know, church. But they had nowhere to live other than that church. And so what they had done is they saved up the equivalent of $1,500, and they needed $1,500 more to get them a home. And so they'd already found the home, and so, which was about a block from the church. And so uh, that's what he'd come to ask Vic and Hope now if, if, if they could get some help in, in purchasing a home where they could move out of the church. All right, so I ride to him, and I meet the family. They've got a, uh, you know, a translator and, and all, and we, we fall in love. Of course we do. And I knew... <laughs> Okay, we, we don't have it, $1,500, but I come home and I get a call. This lady in uh, Houston, Texas, God led her to send some stock, <laughs> corporate stock. I never had any. She said, what's your account so we can wire it to you? I said, what are you talking about? You know, I don't know how to do all that. So they walked us through it, and they send enough through the stock to, to uh, not, only, not only bless them with their own home, you know, but, but some other needs were met too. Their daughter needed surgery and God supplied. Okay, so this, is, this has been for all these years our father's arms, Ukraine, where he came to live. So then they were able to, to embrace and take him in as their family. Okay, now uh, there's uh, Misha and Arthur baptizing uh, Valeri in, the, in their baptistry there. Okay, now, so here's Arthur saving up. Uh, hope now, Vic, Vic at, this, at this particular time, has a, a scholarship program and is, is supporting 200 Ukrainian young people to go to college and continue their education. He was one of those 200. Okay, and so there's a college in Corson where, and he had a bicycle. He loves to ride. He's ready to ride to Birmingham the other day. So he... Uh, so, so he is, uh, uh, you finish the orphanage with the equivalent of an eighth grade education. So he is uh, now, uh, goes to night school and gets the equivalent of high school, and now he's going, and, and with people sacrificially giving and helping him, he gets his four-year degree and a certification to become a teacher. And so the, the supporters who are sacrificing to support is kind of, well, great, wonderful job, young man, and had no idea that he was applying to go to medical school in Kiev. When did you first realize that you wanted that you were called to be a, a medical doctor? Oh, that's a, in the orphanage. In the orphanage. Yeah, in the orphanage, I dream. You about, dream about surgery, about yeah. exams, and yeah, you know, like a, a, a f uh, body about um, phys physiology. 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 Yeah, that's I. So in the orphanage, mm -hmm. you would dream you were doing surgery. Yeah, but that's is impossible. Impossible. Nothing impossible for Jesus. <laughs> so, so Jesus had a plan. Yeah. Okay, so now uh, he's got to go. Now here's this, this child country boy, little country boy uh, in this village. And you can see right here, Kiev is a major, major city, you know, like New York or something. And so... Uh, how did you get to there to, to in order to take this medical exam? Yeah, I must go to Kiev directly yeah. and pass exams. How did you get there? By bus. By bus? Yeah, by bus. How did you get a bus ticket? Uh, Vic. Oh, Vic gave you a bus yes. ticket to go to yeah. sit for yeah. the exam there. Yes. Okay, now, now what was it like the first time mm -hmm. you go and see Kiev? Yeah, that's the first time. By yeah. yourself? Yeah. Subways, million, millions of people. Yeah. Skyline, did that scare you a little bit? Yes, but Jesus said, do not afraid, go. Don't afraid. Don't afraid, <laughs> yeah. Go. Yeah, go. I'm with you, I'm with you. Jesus I'm, let you know that. Yeah, yeah. All right, then, what is the name of the, this medical university? That's the name of Bogomolitz. Bogomolitz, Bogomolitz Medical that, University. Yeah. yeah, in Kiev, this is main... University of Ukraine. That's their Bib Graves Hall there. Okay. And uh, 
Would you believe I can read you what that says on the top right there? <laughs> no. Well, anyway, it, 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 it says, welcome, Valeri. <laughs> <laughs> okay. right. So now, now he goes in there and he takes this examination and there were a thousand applicants for medical school. This is, this is an exclusive medical school internationally. There are doctors who have come through here practicing all over the world. And he, uh, he goes and sits for, how long did it take to take the examination? How long? How long? Eight hours. Eight hours? Yes, eight hours. Okay. There were a thousand applicants and only 70 were selected and he was at the top of that 70. Hallelujah. So, 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 so now he's going to medical school and, um, and he needs a place to live. Okay, this apartment complex you can see here is uh, they have a, a, a flat or a room. Now, how many rooms was, was your apartment? One room. One room? Yeah, and uh, like a restroom. Restroom? Yeah, that's, that's all, but I, completely enough. Did you have to remodel it to make it livable? Did, did you have to, to work in there where you yeah. could live in it? Yeah. It wasn't yeah. livable. Yeah. 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 Until you worked on it. Yeah. By yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Now, so this is where you lived for the six years that yeah. you were going to medical yeah. school? And how far is this from the university? Uh, nearly one hour. Four, nearly? Four, 40, 40 minutes by subway or metro. Okay. So, uh, so you made that trip every day? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, to, to go to class, yeah. you go home. Were there any other college students living here? Or? No. no, no? no, no. So, so you pretty well were alone, mm. but you were not alone. No. no. But you, you were catching the subway and, the, <laughs> and all those people and everything and, yeah. and studying. And, uh, yeah. and then uh, there you are in, in the back with uh, some of your classmates. Yeah, that is uh, when I'm returned to Chakasi. This is my uh, nurse. I teach nurse. Oh, this was not in Kiev. This this was after your residency in Chikasi. Yeah, Chikassi. yeah. Okay. That's just like uh, some students come to hospital. I'm teach uh, like medicine. Okay, so you were teaching medicine in this yeah, hospital yeah. to these others. All right, so you had completed your six years mm -hmm. in Kiev, and then you're doing your residency yeah. in Cherkasy yeah. at the hospital there. Yeah. So that's where that was taken. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and uh, there you are, mm -hmm. like a teacher. <laughs> And uh, now what are you doing here? This is a Czech woman have a cancer of uterus. Mm. And uh, because she have, wi um, um, she have problem with the liver. If you see skin very like uh, yellow skin. Mm. And this is like I check um, we after operation. And I'm listening how balls move. Mm. Like... Um, uh, Uh, wait a minute. That's um, peristaltics. Peristaltics? Yeah, peristaltics. Listen, peristaltics, because sometimes uh, this is like um, comp after operation, uh, sometimes have like compl com uh, complications. Com complications. Yeah. yeah, complications. Like. Uh, Constipation, or, or, yeah, that's okay. very, very. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> 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 Moving right along. <laughs> okay, the uh, you saw the beautiful skyline of Kiev. Uh, you remember those of you who watched the news? February of 2014, this happened. There was a revolt, and all hell broke loose in Kiev. Okay, how did you first, are, you're in Cherkasy doing mm -hmm. your residency. What, how did you first find out about this, through the media? Um, yeah, in 2013, one, three, 13, uh, uh, when Ukraine, uh, we, we have a president Yanukovych, and, uh, and almost people know situation. It's uh, about like difficult economy and difficult time. And like young, um, President Putin have proposed propose to Yanukovych, I give you 20 billion dollars and you give me Ukraine. Hmm. And you, 
Jan of course said, okay, I give you, I give you like mm. Ukraine, and you give me 20 billion dollars. And that's, uh, Ukrainians know about the situation and do not want to join uh, with Russia mm -hmm. because this is uh, no future, okay, mm. uh, with the Russia. Mm. Ukrainian, uh, Ukraine want with Europe like uh, good democracies, uh, good economist, good uh, good quality education. Mm. That's and Yanukovych say no, like uh, to sell Ukraine, okay, and start revolution in Ukraine. And uh, millions of people come to streets and millions. like millions, millions, yeah, millions, and. Uh, um, that's time when I've been in Chukasi, okay. in the hospital, and some uh, organization or some person who uh, responsible of the medical um, medical uh, service in in Kiev, like uh, interview through radio, say mm -hmm. we need uh, like medical volunteers. So you heard on the radio, you knew about yeah. the revolt that was taking place. Yeah. And so you heard on the radio they needed medical volunteers yes. to help treat the people. Yeah, and this is moment uh, Jesus touched my heart and he said, I'm always done with you. Do not afraid. Go to uh, s maybe not treat, uh, yes, I treat lots of bodies, but you must be survive spiritual. 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 Help them survive spiritually. Yes, yeah. Okay, now, so you checked with the administration and they, they released yeah. you to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a interest. bless, bless me. Blessed you to go yeah, and, and go. Uh, volunteer. Yeah. yeah, volunteer. How did you get from Cherkasy back to Kiev? And again, by stickage. And I'm very grateful for Father Arms organization. Yeah. And uh, because that's organization like support me by stickage for bus and like send money. So our, our father's arms through Vic yeah. sent you the ticket to get up there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, send money for... So you had a, a check card. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, that, so that you could eat. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and what, so the, the money that you, was, that you had on the check card so that you could eat, what else did you do with it? And uh, uh, almost I buy medicine because many because we not have a manic, we not have medical stuff like uh, a bondage, woundage, anesthetics, uh, or analgetics. Hmm. Analgetics, I buy. Okay. And uh, because many people have uh, lacerated wound, mm -hmm. wound, wounded, and uh, lots of blood, mm -hmm. and we yeah that's. So this is what you got off the bus and saw. Yeah. Yeah, well, this is my desire, <laughs> desire to. Yeah. I, th I think that anyone that does not believe in hell can't look at this. Hell on earth. And this is the team, yeah. the, med the volunteer yeah. medical team. Yeah. Okay, now you were, you were there treating patients yeah. non-stop. Yes, non-stop. Approximately 12 hours per day during the four months. 12 hours? Yeah. And then how much time did you have off? Nearly four or five hours. Four or five hours, yes. and then you were back on 12 yeah. again. And, yeah. So it was 12, four, five, 12, four, yeah. five. Yeah. For how long? Four months. Four months, yeah. seven days a week. Yes, yes, seven days. In the midst of this blood and carnage yeah. of treating people. Yeah, yeah. And many of them dying. Yeah, that's true, that's true. So while you were treating them, they were dying in your arms. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, sometimes I cannot help because some bullet, bullet, bullet. affect um, main organs like uh, lungs, brain, liver, kidney, when acute, acute bleeding, acute bleeding, and um, what I first ask, 
people, do you believe in Jesus? Yes. Uh, please pray with me and please to repent. Repent with me because uh, physiology, um, physiology bo body, this is nothing, okay? And spiritual bo body, this is uh, you live with Jesus forever, okay? And please pray with me immediately, quickly, because you, mu you must save your spiritual. And that's, that's his work. That's work. That's work. In, uh, yeah. We have every day lots of many people died. Many people. Hundreds. Hundreds. Yeah. And, and you were treating their body, but when you couldn't treat their, you couldn't save their physical life. Yeah, I, yeah, because you were you were praying with them and yeah, sharing Christ with yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. I say, please, please pray if you want survive your your, because this is a land life. Uh, in heaven, we have much better life. Okay, <laughs> much better. <laughs> And please, uh, please pray with me. We have, we take so much for granted. We think because somebody comes to church and says they're a Christian, then they are. So we just share Jesus. This is the truth. You and I are in no different situation than these people right here. We're all dying. It just may not be as quick. We don't know when it is. But it's a point of man wants to die. We want to, we want to dodge the fact that life's not a, a permanent set of physical life. This is the gospel. The one who created us, created us with a will. So that we, would, we could choose to love him. He wants a relationship. He created you and me and all of humanity in His image that He may have a relationship, but you can't have a relationship with a robot. And the reason He gave humankind a will is so we could choose to love Him. But He knew that we would choose to reject Him. The consequence is sin, the self-indulgent nature, selfish. You are selfish. You were born selfish. It's in your Adamic DNA. You can't help it. You were born that way. You can't help being born that way physically any more than a baby in that hospital can help being born a drug addict because her mother was, or his mother was. Each of us were born crack babies, corrupt rebellion against Christ's kingdom. And we're helpless, and we're miserable. And the wages of sin is death. And that's what you see with the carnage all over the planet and all the violence and all the death that's around us that's intensifying. The evil that's intensifying is because of the selfish nature of man. Why would man even have to have a government to keep at bay his selfish, self-destructive nature for a season? But the wages of sin is death and you're going to die and I'm going to die. And here's the one who created us for himself. And I promise you, he knows the beginning from the end. He's this incredible, mysterious creator. We cannot possibly begin to understand him, but he knew we would reject him. But it would give him the opportunity to come into planet Earth through the womb of a virgin where he wouldn't be born a crack baby without a damnic nature. But he was tempted in like manner as you and I, yet without sin. And when he went to the cross that day, He was publicly declaring that he loves you. You with a copyrighted thumbprint, the one who created you with the ability to think, knows your thoughts. And he passionately loves you as if you're his only child. And he says, you cannot, you cannot be good enough. No matter who you impress, no matter how much money you make, no matter how many points you put on the scoreboard, you can't prove yourself. One selfish thought disqualifies a human being from God's perfect heaven. We're helpless until we see who He is and why He came. And when He went to the cross that day, the sinless, 
Lamb of God, he became the fulfillment of that Old Testament and all those prophets. He came to take away the sins of the world and he demonstrated a love for you that's greater than your selfish rebellion. And to as many as received him, he comes in and gives us a new nature. And more and more and more because he is at work in, in the hearts of those who will let him love him. We realize we're not alone. We realize we have a savior and a shepherd. We're not trying to do right to be right. We have dialogue with him and we know him. Stretch out on this couch, open up your mind, dig back into your past. It's analyzing time. You just might be a schizophrenic, masochistic and sadistic too. If they don't know what to call you, any $10 word will do. So don't try to avoid the wisdom of Sigmund Freud. If you think you're thinking's on the blink, well, you can sell out to a shrink. After all, it's a crazy world. Everybody's fighting to cope, help fill up the padded rooms, legalize a little more dope. You can pickle your brain with booze. You can smoke your head with grass. You can get you a case of religion, child, but none of that junk will last. You can bury your head in the sand, bet your life on some retirement plan, but in the final analysis, all that really matters is, do you know the man? Not know about him, do you know him? And there's only one way to get to know him, and that's let him in. That tug you may feel on your heart right now. That's Jesus knocking at the door of your heart. And he wants to come in and not dominate you and be your boss, but come in and be your friend that sticks closer than a brother and guide you through your life. And it doesn't matter what you got working against you. When you let him come in, when you receive him, then... You're experiencing what he has been experiencing all his life. I'm never alone. Jesus has a plan. I'm not afraid. I'm going to go. And this intimate love affair with this person that comes and sticks closer to you than a brother begins to become a reality in your life. And you begin to experience that peace that passeth all understanding and that joy inexpressible and full of glory that comes from knowing him, not knowing about him. The sinner's prayer is this. Well, for Vic, it was, I'll give you 10 days to change my life. <laughs> but the sinner's prayer oftentimes is a simple one word. He says, I love you, let me. And I say, yes. Will you let him? Not to stand up and come down here to this altar. The rich young ruler and so many people can come to this altar. But if there's no heart change and everything remains the same, you can call it repentance. You can get your name on the church roll. You can get baptized and make your family proud of you, but still be so empty inside, trying to get the approval of others to prove you're somebody. It's got to happen in the altar in your heart. It's got to happen there, not here. Oftentimes we come here, but here is all for naught if it's not happening inside of you. Would you say yes to him now? There's an invitation built into the gospel. You just share Christ and him crucified and the love God has for you. Every person in this room is either rejecting him or receiving him. You know and he knows. What are you going to do with the Lord Jesus Christ and his claim on your life? Well, that's up to you and him. I love it when I see the light turn on in people from up here. There's a power in that gospel. I'm not going to we'll break Baptist tradition. Let's not get up and come down. Let's let him come to you and yield to his lordship that your life may be fulfilled that you may experience life and life in abundance. Now, if you right now are experiencing that, ask him who he would have you go and share that with. And he will lead you to somebody 
not that's full of anger and politics and criticism and fault finding. No, no, no. The people around you where you see the fruit of the Spirit, gentleness, joy, patience, meekness, temperance, faith. Galatians 5.22 said all of that is love. He will show you who to go to and let them know that Christ has come to live in you. And then, in his time and way, it'll be made public, but you'll have one, one close friend you can counsel with and connect with that will guide you. Not for show, but for reality. Okay, now. He's, uh, I'm learning so much from this young man. I'm seeing, I'm seeing personally, over the years, you know, every two or three years, we, we would see him. And, and at, at first, it was, it was a, with a translator. And then when Patty and I pull up to the course of church and get out of the car, and I hear somebody say, Bob and Patty. I said, he's learning English. <laughs> And he comes and we embrace, but there was never time to fellowship, to communicate, to get to know each other. That can only come through community, communication, and communion, or fellowship. That's how you get to know somebody. So we pick him up at the airport, and on the way, I was really getting to know this young man that I'd known since. And it's, it's helping me so much because there's such a purity. And see, I, I can say that about him, and it's, there, there's no temptation to get the big head. He has no hidden agendas. He has a pure heart. And, and, and he is mentoring me. And he's showing me what it looks like to walk in the Spirit. Now, last, this is Jay Damoth. By the way, he's uh, uh, our father's arms family, and and and, uh, and George and Tommy, several are here, and and uh, but uh, of course he immediately became our family. Now he's staying on Mountain Street, my mother's house, 508 Mountain Street, next door to where you used to live, and um, and and we want him to be well taken care of while he's here. You know, obviously, we want all of his needs to be met. We want him to be comfortable. You know, air conditioned. We want him to eat well and. And, and Patty's over mothering him, but that's all right. He, it's, uh, and uh, so we've got him a nice place to stay where he can have privacy, and he keeps it every spare minute. He keeps his nose in a medical book. But he's, uh, and he's, he loves to work. He's hanging sheetrock. We're doing some remodeling. We're building a free clinic in Jacksonville. Some of you already know about that, and he is all over that. Got the sheetrock up and uh, getting it finished, and, you know, God's, God's moving in our midst, and, and he's already become a, a vital part of that. Okay, so I go get him in the morning and take him to do the work he loves. He starts telling me everything he needs. And, and, um, and, uh, and one night, Jay goes to see him. This was last week. And about 9.30, Jay calls me angry. And he said, last Tuesday night, three police broke into the house with, with spotlights on his face, woke him up, set him down in a chair, and interrogated him for four hours. What? Now, and, and I'm thinking, I'm getting mad too, and I'm thinking, why didn't he tell me? And he said he didn't want to worry you. Now, there's one thing about Val. You know, he's learning too. And he's learning, he's learning to interact with family. You know, and, and, and families are one you can trust with what's going on in your life. You know, you, you've had 16 years of being totally alone. That's totally understandable. But it's like the next morning, or, or that night, I, how are you going to sleep when you're wanting to go whoop up on the police, you know? And, and, uh, and you, you're imagining all these things. Why would they do that to him? And so the next, I, I pray, now listen, we pray through things. And thank you, therapy. That song we sang, Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart. Thank you, therapy, is, is Philippians 4, 6, and 7 being applied to your life. Anytime you're anxious, anytime you're angry, anytime you're upset and disturbed, there's a guarantee in Scripture 
Be anxious about nothing, but in everything through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Make your requests known unto God, and the peace of God that passeth all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. That was written thousands of years ago. And if it didn't work, we wouldn't still be reading it. Thank you therapy is powerful. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's Satanists, hell's angels, warlocks, witches, psychopaths, sociopaths getting set free with thank you therapy in the planet right now. Well, if it works for, it, and it works for me. So I thank you myself to sleep that night. But I get up the next morning and I go get him. I said, why didn't you tell me that? Oh, I didn't want to worry you. And I said, what happened exactly? He said, oh, I, the back door wasn't locked. And, and, and I was in a deep sleep and these lights in my face. And I showed them my documentation. And, you know, and I said, well, they obviously didn't. He said, I don't know if, if some of the neighbors saw me riding the bicycle and they thought I was a terrorist or something. <laughs> I said, I don't think they looked at you and thought you was a terrorist. You know? And so, so I go directly to the mayor's office and, and bring him in there. And he's, uh, we'll start with the mayor. And so, and, and Patty, uh, Carol, uh, Mayor Smith's secretary is in there and, he, and he's out, but I introduce him to her. And she hears his story, and I tell her what happened. She oh, no. And I said, yeah, is the chief in? So she called the chief is in. So we, we go over and see Chief Thompson. And I walk right in, and Chief Thompson is very gracious and, and kind, and, and I tell him his story. He's a compassionate man who loves the Lord. And he's incredibly moved by what's happening with this young man Who's going to, it looks like he's going to finish his education in, in, uh, in Birmingham, and I'll tell you about that in just a moment. But here I'm with the chief of police, and he's incredibly inspired and moved by his story. And I said, in chief, last Tuesday night, some officers came into this home on Mountain Street that's our guest house with flashlights in his face. He said, what? He said, we'll be at the bottom of this. So he goes on his computer right there, and, and, and he finds it. You know, he said, was there an alarm or anything? I said, I don't have any alarm. My mom lived in that house with her husband, Howard, at that time who had Alzheimer's, and she would not let them put him in the hospital. And so what we did was we put a switch on the front porch light that's got three settings. One's off, one is on, and the one in the middle is the flashing light. <laughs> you know, it's a distress call. And so he didn't turn the light all the way off. <laughs> and he left the door unlocked. And I looked at the police report. And it's, it's, instead of being interrogated for four hours, and you know, he didn't sleep for four hours. Okay, but it was a little unnerving. But they they came in. It says uh, exchange student. You know, uh, uh, all is ten four, and all they were in there about two minutes or something. But they went in there to check on him. So they were doing a great job. Okay, all right. But he got to meet some in the mayor's office and uh, the chief of police. And so his fan base just got increased by all that. <laughs> and it just cost him a few hours sleep. What's the big deal, you know? And so anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. All right, now wh where does he go from here? Okay, we picked him up at the airport. God provided the funds for him to, to come to visit America, which he's always wanted to do. You know, with the expectation of us taking him back to the Atlanta airport uh, at the end of August to fly back, to spend a couple of months with us. And so he comes, and everything he owns, he brings with him in a suitcase about that tall and about that wide, used suitcase. Everything he owns is in it. And a fourth of that suitcase was some ceramic teapots and cups for Patty and three boxes of Ukrainian chocolate for me. <laughs> <laughs> and it, and it uh, taking up a fourth of a suitcase... That's all he has. And he, we, we've discussed this in depth. We want what Jesus wants. And his people, uh, there's such a, a continued turmoil there. And our father's arms in, in Cherkasi, working with prisoners and, and orphans, right now a lot of our attention and resources are going toward refugees who are running from East Ukraine from, from the Russians, and they can't, they got fight in them, but you can't fight this day and age without weapons. And so it's not inconceivable that there will be a draft to take up arms and to fight the Russians, which, which for a lot of young men his age would be a death sentence. 
Now, if we're, we're going to hold each other very loosely, and if God wants him to go back and lead Vladimir Putin to Jesus, you know what? We don't want to stand in the way of that. <laughs> Nothing's impossible, and he knows that. But we sense that God is leading him here to continue his education in Birmingham. So we canceled his plane ticket, and his, his, his vacation visa, B-1 visa, is, is valid until Jan mid-January of 2016. And we can file for an extension, but he can get a work visa and remain here. And it looks like now, it's, it's, this is where we are. Next week, this may be confirmed. But the, he, has, he has spent several days at UAB in Princeton with some doctors getting to know some doctors, and they're hearing his story, and there's a support group that God is raising up in, you know, um, among surgeons there in, in Birmingham, and they are preparing a job offer for him at Princeton, and uh, that he will be several uh, opportunities where he can work there in the hospital, and their human resource department will take care of the, of the immigration issues and, uh, and put him on clinical rotation right away, and he can finish his final year of residency in, in, in one of the hospitals in Birmingham. Now, now, he's an OBGYN oncology surgeon because the Ukrainian government told him what his practice would be. And he says he loves it, but he'd always dreamed uh, that he might be a heart surgeon, right? <laughs> and so that's conceivable now. And, and what place in the world, you know, would be any better to continue your education and, and become skilled? And so we'll take just a, a, a few minutes if you have any questions for him. Anyone? Well, now, uh, he, he, while he was in Birmingham, he went to Shades Mountain Baptist Church, which has 5,000 people. And, you know, and then he comes back here, he says, uh, uh, Bob, I like Williams. <laughs> <laughs> so he is, uh, he is our church family. And uh, as you can see, we were sharing the journey together even before he got to sit here in front of you. He's your son, he's your brother, he's your friend, and, uh, and welcome home. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. okay, so since there's uh, no questions, um, this constipation. <laughs> <laughs> no. Let's pray for him. Come down here. Would you stand, please? Uh, if anyone is led, come down here and we'll lay hands on him. Or, you know, stay there and... Jesus, just the prospect of knowing you is incredible, but, but we know that each of us can know you more deeply than we've ever known you before, wherever our station in life might be, and thank you for sending this young man to, to help us become more acquainted with you as we see his walk in his life. And mm -hmm. yeah. Father, forbid that I ever complain again. Father, thank you for exposing our entitlement mentality where we think we deserve more than hell itself. Thank you for showing us that whatever we have to walk through, your grace is sufficient. You'll be there with us, and all you've ever offered us is life. 
We don't know what lies ahead, Lord, but we know that we're in a world that's coming apart. And if we draw conclusions based on what we see, we draw the wrong conclusion. But thank you for a church family where we can come and get to know you. Amen. Not analyze you, but get to know you. And experience your love and connection with each other. And be your body in the earth. Jesus. Lord, we want to thank you for continuing to let us know which doors you're opening for this uh, son and this friend. We want to thank you, Lord. You, you brought him here, so we're not going to start worrying about him now. We, we, uh, we sense that, you're, that the Birmingham connection is, is coming together, and that's your will for his life. And, and, uh, but, Lord, we stand open and available and sensitive and, uh, to you, sensitive to you as to how we can serve him. Not with bright ideas or control, or, but just to serve him. Thank you, God, for, for loving us and allowing us to share that love with each other in the brief time we have here on this planet. We pray for an awakening, an awakening that you are much, much more than we've known. Jesus, Jesus. We love you, sir. Thank you for loving fear out of us. The fear of what other people may think of us. That we can step out boldly with you in the face of whatever the adversity is. That we do not need the approval of man when we know we have your approval. And you demonstrated that at the cross for each of us. May the remainder of our days here in the planet, whatever the age, may we bring glory to you. Like our friend Doug Ponder and so, yeah. many, so many in this church family, we see Jesus in him. We see Jesus in each other. We see Jesus come alive, Jesus, and love this troubled world through the likes of us. We delight in knowing that you're pleased. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ. His Son, give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ, His Son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. Again, and now let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. Instructions about. Oh, may I have your attention, please. Uh, well, we have a we're having a reception oh, right. for food, so please stick around and help.